Thank you, Mrs. President. Uh, I'm very happy to be back to Zagreb. And to be back to Zagreb in this beautiful time, since I was here so often in dark times. I remember being in Dubrovnik when the Serbian Chetnik bombed Dubrovnik. I remembered in a, a few weeks after the devastation of Vukovar, crossing Vukovar when Vukovar was transformed into a real ghost town. I remember that it was one of the most terrible emotions of my life, the image and the reality of Bukovar devastated by the ultranationalist and fascist militias of Serbia. I remember Zagreb when I came back from Sarajevo, when I came back from my reportage, from my shooting of my movie about Bosnia, when I went out of the hell of Sarajevo, the hell of the bombing, the hell of the mass crime, the hell of the mass graves, the hell of children shooted by snipers, I remember arriving here in this square or at Esplanade with such a sigh of relief, with such an impression to be back to to be again in a place of great culture and great civilization. It was such a contrast between this place of civilization, which was Sarajevo, but which was transformed into hell and a peaceful and uh, cultivated and civilized Zagreb. So I have so many souvenirs in this country from Vukovar to Zagreb to Split also that I am really happy, really moved to be here on this gorgeous day with this gorgeous weather also. I'm happy to be here also on this precise day, this day of the anniversary, as you all know, of the defeat of Nazism in Europe. I'm happy to be in Zagreb in Croatia during this historical day of the end of the Nazi nightmare on, in Europe. I know the price which Croatia paid for the liberation of Croatia at this time and the liberation of Europe. I know the 150, maybe 200,000 partisans in Croatia who risk their life at this time and who, for a lot of them, paid the price of the blood in order to liberate this country and to liberate Europe. 200,000 is a lot. It is a lot compared to the size of Croatia. Probably Croatia is one of the countries in Europe who pay the highest price to the resistance against Hitler and Nazism. I know that at the same time there was the Ustashi state. I know that there was Ante Pavelic. I know that there is still today in the modern Croatia, some nostalgics, some women and men who bear a sort of nostalgia of this horrible time of the independent Ustashi state. I know that even recently, we, you had in Croatia some people who thought that it, it was normal that the same flag could be the flag of the, of the Ustashi state and of the independent state of Croatia. I know that there were people who believed it was normal to transform the square of the victims of fascism into a square of the heroes of Croatia as if the history of Croatia was a block and a hole 
but I know also that the Croatia which we feast today, which we celebrate today, is the other one, the true one, the grand one, the great one, the Croatia who paid also such a high tribute to war against fascism before Second World War. I am the son of a partisan in the Spanish Republican War, and I cannot forget how many Croats were embedded, involved, committed in the international brigades in Spain. I know that it is in Croatia, in the island of Rab, that was formed also the first Jewish battalion before the French battalions of the Africa army, before the battalions of the first uh, Armée Libre, Division Française Libre. It is for this Croatia that I am here today. I know that it is this Croatia which is celebrated today, and I am really happy on this special day, on this special birthday day, to be here in Zagreb, celebrating the grand Croatia, the anti-fascist Croatia, one again of the countries of Europe who paid the most to the anti-fascist cause and to be, to be here with you to celebrate that. Today, it is also a second anniversary. Very important one also for me and I'm sure for all of you. It is more or less a few weeks ago, not even a few days. It is the, second, the 20th anniversary, 20th anniversary of the Washington DC Treaty. The treaty from which the people of Croatia and the people of Bosnia Herzegovina so dear to my heart made the peace and agreed to face together the Serbian militias. I know, again, that there is, there was, and there is still today some people who are nostalgic of these few months between uh, the fall of 93 to May 94, during which the army of Herzegovina and the army supported by Croatia did fight against the army of Bosnia-Herzegovina. I know that there is probably still in the Croatia of today some citizens or maybe responsible who truly believe that Croatia has some rights on the part of Bosnia and that Bosnia should be shared into three entities. I know that there are still some Croats today who believe that uh, Bobetko or Suzak are great men and heroes, but I prefer to remember today I prefer to celebrate today with you on this special day the great gesture of your president, Ivo Josipovic, who went to the Sarajevo parliament, this great statesman, who is also a great musician, who went to the Sarajevo parliament in order to, to ask forgiveness, to ask pardon for what was done in Bosnia-Herzegovina with, for too long, the complicity of the Croatian power. I prefer today to remember that. I prefer to remember the 
200,000 refugees who took shelter in the cities of Croatia, the refugees from Bosnia, I see still today as unforgettable souvenirs, the hotels of Split, full of brothers by, by spirit, and maybe, and often not only by, by spirit, who were hunted out of Bosnia and who were welcomed with open arms in this country. And I prefer to remember against those who still believe that there should be a partition of Bosnia. I prefer to remember the time, the great time, when after the Washington DC treaty, the two armies of Bosnia-Herzegovina and of Herzegovina joined their forces in order to defeat Milosevic. This day, the day when the two peoples of Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina joining their forces defeated the militias of Karadzic and Mladic, the fascist ideology which they did bear was a great day for freedom, a great day for Europe, a great day for the world. And this is what I wish to remember today. And my wish is also that this spirit of union, this spirit of alliance could prevail on other grounds today. I'm thinking in particular of the question of the entry in Europe of Bosnia-Herzegovina. I'm so impatient to see Bosnia entering Bosnia-Herzegovina, and I have the dream of Croatia giving the hand, helping Bosnia to enter the assembly where the Croats are already. I dream of Croatia becoming at least the best advocate, the best advocate of the Bosnian cause in Europe. This is my wish for this second anniversary, which we cannot prevent from celebrating today. The hasard des calendriers, the chance of the calendars. And there is a third anniversary today, in a few weeks, in a few weeks, you are going to celebrate a third anniversary, which is no less important than the two others, in a way. In another way, on another ground, on another scale maybe, but important too. In a few weeks, you are going to celebrate the first anniversary, not the 69th, not the 20th, but the first anniversary of the entry of your country in Europe precisely. In a few weeks, it will be exactly one year since after such, so many hopes, so many um, victories on himself, the Croatian people was finally admitted to enter in Europe. And what I want to say on the occasion of this first anniversary is that there is in my country and in the rest of Europe a lot of people, a few people, maybe a lot, who think that enough is enough, that Europe has become too big a space that the entry of Bulgaria, Romania, and then of Croatia might be the excess entry. I'm so shocked by this argument. I'm so upset by those who even say 
that we enlarge the circle to Croatia when we know, and I know, so familiar with Zagreb, that Zagreb is not the uh, margin of Europe, is not the end of the circle, but is one of the beating hearts of the spirit of Europe. And admitting Croatia in Europe was not a gift. It was a duty for us, Europeans of the old Europe. I say that to you today, but I say it, of course, in the same terms, in Berlin, in Madrid, or in Paris. But what I would like to say, to tell you, is that I know also, of course, that there is, symmetrically, some who think here in Zagreb that this entry in Europe at the end of the day was not such a good deal for Croatia. Maybe those believed that the entry of Europe will be a sort of miracle and that all of a sudden the country would go from shadow to, to light, from dark times to sunny weather, probably. But what I would like to tell them with all my, my heart and my creed is that I think so deeply that for Croatia, exactly as for France or for Germany, Europe is such a chance. Europe is such an opportunity. It is an opportunity on a financial level. You know better than I what it meant in terms of um, investments in this country to be at last invited at the table. Multiplication by five in 2014, multiplication by eight in 2015 of the investments or subvention of Europe to this country. You know what it means, and this has to be said and said again, what it means for Croatia to be in Europe in terms of governance, transparency, fight against corruption. This was one of the obligation to which were sub was submitted the state of Croatia as any other countries, including in the Balkans. You did the work. The state of Croatia, pushed by the people of Croatia, did the work of fighting the bad devils of corruptions, of corruption of uh, proving transparency, of implementing good governing. And this, for a country, is priceless. And also, in relation to this work on memory, which I mentioned before, Croatia, as all of us, has to face a work of memory, a work of sorrow and of mourning about its bad past, its devils, as we have in France. And I do believe that the entry in Europe has been such an opportunity to complete, to achieve, and to end provisionally this work. For example, some uh, criminals of the communist time convicted of crimes against dissidents of Croatia during the time of Tito who have been indicted, who have been 
condemned because of and at the moment of the entry of Croatia in Europe. So I, I would like to tell to all the Eurosceptics of this country that of course Europe is not a miracle, that of course Europe is not the absolute medicine which will cure all the social despair, unemployment, and so on, but that for the spirit of a people, and for its economy, and for its infrastructures, I would love to cross, if I had time, to go on the new road going from Zagreb to Split and to Dubrovnik, which is, in a way, a child of this European entry, all that is a chance for this country. And before debating, I would like to, to stress a last point, to stress a last point and to, to make a last remark. Euroscepticism skepticism is not a privilege of Croatia. We have Eurosceptics also in France, in Germany, and in all Europe. And maybe the next elections will prove, I hope not, but I fear yes, that there is as many Eurosceptics in my country than in yours. Euroscepticism is a bad wind which blows in the territory of Europe. And not only Euroscepticism, but Euro defeatism. Defeat, defeatism. For the first time since 20 years, the United Europe has an enemy. Since 1989, Europe had no enemy. It was a sort of land of uh, sugar and honey, a sort of Fukuyama state, looking like a hand of history dream without enemy. We know today that Europe has an enemy. You know his name, we all know his name, the enemy of Europe, the man who wants to defeat to humiliate the values of Europe, who wants to prove that the Mussolini style of his governing is better than the democratic aspect of governing in Europe is Vladimir Putin. The new Mussolini, Vladimir Putin, acting exactly as Mussolini, you put the photographs of uh, Vladimir Putin making sport, exposing himself side by side with the Mussolini, Mussolini photos, he is a say. So Europe has an enemy, and this enmity, this war has a stage, which is Ukraine today. Ukraine is the theater in which for the tragedy of Ukrainian people, this war of Putin against European values is staged. And in front of that, you know, Europe acts in a very strange way. Europe makes some sanctions, but they are light and which are not even implemented a few weeks ago. The president of the Duma, who was, who is on the list of sanctions of the US and of the EU, was in Europe because he was invited by an international organization. We have a minister of foreign affairs in Germany, Mr. Steinmeier, who recently said in an interview in Le Monde and in other newspapers, who said, 
the emergency is not too late to let Putin becoming our enemy. Ne laissons pas Putin devenir notre enemy. Let's don't let Putin become our enemy. After Crimea, after occupation and subversion of the east of Ukraine, after Putin denying his word, his treaties, his agreements, the international law, a, great, a, a minister of a great country of Europe said, not yet our enemy, we have to be very careful in order that he does not become our enemy. And I learned today, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ambassador, but I, I learned today that unfortunately, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, is welcome in France in the beaches of the D-Day next June. So I think I have to observe, we have to observe, that the European reaction to what is happening in Ukraine, the European reaction to the fact that Europe has nowadays an enemy who is Putin is very weak. As if we did not really understand what is at stake. As if Europe was blind and deaf in front of what is really happening in this matter. Why do I say that? Because I believe that Zagreb, Croatia, is probably one of the countries, if not the country, in Europe. Because now you are European. One country, one vote. You are member, full members. And Croatia is probably the country where the reality of what is happening today between Putin and Europe is the clearer. You know in Croatia what national communism is. You know the smell of this beast. You know the lies and the propaganda which feed, that feed national communism. You had to stand that. You had to get rid of that. I'm thinking of the former great partisan who became a national communist, who was Franjo Tujman. He was a great partisan during the Second World War, but he became, at the end of his life, a national communist, a sort of little Putin. You know that. You have the experience of that. You have also in this country the experience of the sort of propaganda which Putin develops. What does Putin say? Putin says Ukraine is not the stage of a popular uprising. Ukraine is a country of old fascists. All the strategy of Putin is to have the ghost of fascism overshadowing the Ukraine of today. Remember 91, 1991. Remember the Serbian propaganda. Remember the messages which came from Kosic and from Milosevic and from all these people. They said exactly the same, forgetting the great tradition of partisanship, forgetting the heroism of the Croatian heroes, they said, Ustashi state, shadow of Ustashi state, and that was the reason of the pretext of this total war of extermination in some cities like Vukovar, which was launched by Serbia. So you know the man, you know the speech, you know the propaganda. You know also that like Lithuania, Estonia, like Poland, like, like Bulgaria, you are 
you would be, you could be, if Europe does not wake up on the front line of this new sort of Cold War. And again, my dream is to, to hear from here, from this city, from the parliament of this city, from the statesmen of this country, from the citizens of this city, to hear a strong message addressed to all the peoples of Europe. There, is some, there are some little states, little countries, that are great people. Croatia is a, little con a small country, but a great people who proved to be great in so many occasions. I believe that this is an occasion, again, to show the memory which inhabits the spirits of Croatia, the courage which is embedded in the culture of this country, and the occasion would be, would mean addressing to all the peoples of Europe a message of wiseness, of lucidity, which is today lacking and which nobody addresses. Croatia could do that. Croatia could be this messenger of lucidity. And again, today, on this 69th anniversary birthday of the fall of Nazism, on this 20th anniversary of the Washington DC Treaty, on this first anniversary of your entry of Europe, this is my personal and humble dream for this country. Thank you very much, waiting for your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now proceed with the debate, so I will ask you to please sit down. I will take a place as well. Um, maybe we should, would you mind if we, thank you. Now, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful statement. Uh, and we have to also say hello to your friends, I guess. Uh, now, you have brought with you a uh, famous actor, uh, Mr. Jacques Weber, uh, and director, uh, actress uh, Ariane Debay. Did I say that correctly? I, I'm, I'm really afraid that my French isn't so very well. Uh, and famous director Dani Stanovic, uh, and also former uh, uh, correspondent and spokesperson for the uh, ICTY, uh, Ms. Florence Atma. Welcome. And we hope that you will also engage in our conversation. Um, now, you told that in your, in your talk, you, you said that you, you seem to be concerned about the future of Europe. Uh, the idea of Europe is at stake, some would say, like for instance, The Economist, uh, a, a newspaper that isn't exactly a bastion of the left, that the idea of democracy is also as, a, at stake. Uh, do you feel the same? Do, are you afraid for European idea and democratic idea? I am afraid for democratic idea if European spirit does not prevail. I, I do believe that less Europe will mean less democracy and that more Europe will mean more democracy. It is true for this country, it is true for mine. If Europe uh, one day would decay or be destroyed, it, will, it would mean that populist ideas non-democratic ideas, our national communists, because you have national communists, but we have ours, Marine Le Pen, would win uh, and prevail. So, of course, I'm afraid for democracy, exactly in the same way as I am afraid for Europe. Um, what can be done about it? To vote, first of all, to go to go and vote, not to be intimidated and, and impressed by the, by the 
propaganda of those who did not learn and did not forget anything and who want to go to the old good times of a corrupted state and uh, state owned by some uh, mafias and some gangs. We all have that in all our countries. For example, I hear and I read here in this country a few days ago an article saying that, that Europe means the rule of the bankers, that Europe means the rule of the finance, that the more Europe you have, the more free are, is the world of money. It's exactly the opposite. It is the European Union, and namely the European Parliament, who voted and implemented some real rules, laws against the crazy money against the deregulated world of finance. If there were in 2008 some progress on this ground, if the banks were demanded and obliged to diminish their uh, will of power, it was partly because of the will of some statesmen in our countries, but the most, the most important role was the role of the European Union, the Commission and the Parliament, which really uh, published and uh, implemented some anti-money rules. So what has to be done, you ask me, what can be done? Did, of course, change Europe from inside, De, uh, putting more democracy in the heart of Europe, but implementing more Europe and not less. It is a bad dream. It is an absurd propaganda to tell us, French and Croats, that Europe is, by essence, a bureaucratic and blind power which works and walks against the peoples it's the opposite. Europe has to be reformed, of course. And I hope that some parties will come in power in the next elections, which will have the will to reform. But to go against Europe would be a disaster. Now, in about two weeks' time, May the 25th, people of Europe will have the opportunity to vote. Um, some of them say today that we actually don't have a choice. Whatever we do, uh, it will be Germany, especially for the last several years, that will decide what, uh, what will go on in Europe. Uh, do you think that kind of argumentation is, is serious? It is not true. It is not true. Uh, there will be a parliament. There will be a president of the commission. Uh, all that will be democratically elected in a very imperfect way, as is always democracy. Democracy is never a miracle solution. And in this process, all the peoples of Europe will have their voice, their possibility and duty to express themselves and their influence. I just gave you an example in my first statement one country, this one, Capital Zagreb, has the power to express, to, to, to raise a strong voice against what is happening to Ukraine. The Croatian people may do it, will be heard, will be necessarily listened the voice of the Croatian people in the European Parliament, if it happened, would be taken into account. Democracy in was, is one man, one vote. One country, one vote, as I said before. And it is another way of defeatism to say 
that game is done, that game is over, that Mrs. Merkel has all the power, it is untrue. The power in democracy belongs to the peoples, belongs to the mental insurrection of the peoples. When the people want, when the public opinions express themselves, nothing can stop them in democracy. No chief of state can oppose himself to a strong stream, strongly expressed when it comes from the public opinion, therefore, from the peoples who compose it. And Germany is one people in Europe, as France is one people in Europe. Um, so at not only what happens within Europe is what matters, but also what happens outside Europe. It's uh, the showcase. It well, there are some places where Europe can show how strong it is. One that you have mentioned is Ukraine. The other is Bosnia. Uh, Bosnia has been a, so to say, case state, stuck in a limbo since the Dayton Agreement. Um, you, will you will probably say that Europe is not doing enough to resolve this status quo in, in Bosnia. Uh, but why? Why do you think that, it, that is happening in the middle, in the heart of Europe, with, only, with, only, with, with less than 20 years uh, uh, since some really bad things happened in the middle of Europe? Maybe because bad things happened. Maybe because Europe feels guilty about these bad things. And maybe because guiltiness is never a good advisor. I, I do think that very often, in some, at least, of those who decide in Europe, there is this idea, this shadow, this, uh, this uh, phantom of guiltiness. Bosnia, Herzegovina, which is a dream for me, is a nightmare for some. In France, in Germany, in all Europe, in Croatia. What is for us maybe a dream is for so many a nightmare. And when you have a nightmare, what do you do? You don't want to hear about it. You want to expel it from your mental landscape. You want to forget the nightmare. And this is probably one of the reasons why Bosnia is not only treated this way, but enclosed, imprisoned since 20 years in this absurd, counterproductive, crazy, and maybe even worse, treaty of Dayton. Dayton was a bad deed. Dayton, which was, supposed, which was supposed to sign the defeat of the Serbs, was the triumph, the victory of their targets, and was a way of putting on paper the target of war of the Serbs. So since Dayton, there is a bad consciousness, mauvaise conscience as uh, philosophers say, Hegel and so on, the bad consciousness of Europe. As Karl Marx said, um, a specter, a ghost, haunts Europe, which is not, no longer communism, which is Bosnia. There is a ghost, uh, which is the ghost of Bosnia, who haunts the Europe of today. And my belief, is that we have to break that. We have to break this um, terrible silence. And uh, personally, with some of my friends who are here, it is one of our commitments of the next month or years of our lives to repair the injury which was done to Bosnia to repair the, the wrong which was made to Bosnia-Herzegovina. And again, like what I said about Croatia, when Bosnia will come in, inside Europe, 
it will not be a gift which we'll, we, we will make to Bosnia. It will be a, a duty which at the end we will respect and implement. Thank you. With these thoughts, we will open the floor for the public. If anybody wants to raise the question, please. Uh, preferably, in, in, preferably in English, but in, if not, okay. in, in, in Croatian English. also is in very English. well, and then I can translate. In English. Is maybe European Union mistake? It, sorry. Is maybe European Union mistake? Because uh, uh, I think that maybe people from former empires understand each other better. For example, Spanish people uh, understand better with Mexican people than with Finland people. So you, you can something say. All European countries are in a way inheritors of this law of empires. All the important countries of Europe, the big countries, were empires in a way. And their empires were dismantled. And all of them should know the, the rule and the theorem, I you say, the theorem, the equation. But unfortunately, it is not the only case. There is, in the DNA of Europe, a great strength and a great weakness. There is a huge and noble pride, and there is a, a terrible self-injury. Uh, there is both. Europe was the fatherland of the best democracy secularism, human rights. But Europe was also the fatherland of the worst. Colonization, totalitarianism, fascism, Nazism. It is the twofold in heritage of Europe. We are, all of us, the sons of this double crown, of the, this double monarchy, like for the Habsburg state, the double monarchy of the light and of the shadow of Europe. There is a fight between the two. And we people have to be, and we are in fact, willing or not, the referees, the referees, les arbitres, of this fight between the two memories of Europe. In this country, you have the two memories. You have the memories of the Ustaches, which was one of the worst among the worst concentration camps in Europe. And you have the memory also of the partisan which I, which I quoted and of the Spanish Republican uh, army and so on. This is the history of Europe. This is the twofold memory of our continent. And this is the fight of our generations. Thank you. Another question? Yes, please. The front. Please just be so kind to introduce yourself. My name is Stin, I'm, an, I'm a high school student, and I would like to ask you, since you talked about Ukraine and about Vladimir Putin, whom you call a national communist, which is a term I would like to hear defined. Since the European Union is a global, uh, a global player, what exactly is the European Union going to do about Ukraine, especially considering that the Ukrainian government is also fascist, which you stand against, and has used fascist symbols and fascist characters in their fight to retain power and legitimacy? This is what Putin says, and that's, this is what the, the Russian medias of today say that the Ukrainian state is a fascist state. That's what you said. Yes. This is the message of Putin. And I see that the message is efficient since <laughs> you are, um, you received apparently the message. The problem is that it is not true. Symbols of fascism, which one? On Maidan, Maidan Square, which is the Cross Mayor Square of Zagreb, the equivalent on Maidan Square. During three months, every day, there was free speech, free speech. Anyone could take the mic and express himself. 
anyone could express the most crazy ideas he wanted. All the craziest ideas were expressed on Maidan, except one. Look at the press, Google that. There is one idea, strangely enough, which was not once expressed, which was anti-Semitism and fascism. There was not one speech reported on Maidan since December till last Sunday going in this sense of the Putin, which uh, Putin propaganda pretends. Not one fascist uh, slogan on the walls. Some fascists in the streets, that's true, the sector right and the Svoboda uh, party, they represent in the last election of 2012, 13% of the electoral body, 13%. Today, we'll see, 25 of May. But as all the polls say, they are back to four, five, maybe six percent. There is less fascists in Ukraine than in Russia. There is less fascists in Ukraine today than in, Francia, in France. Marine Le Pen, for me, I said that in France many times, is a fascist she will probably gather 20, maybe more percent of the electoral body. Liverpool, Liverpool yeah. <coughs> this is another story. So please don't fall in this propaganda. And I would add something. You know, I'm not obsessed with anti-Semitism, but it is a good sign, of course. It is a red, it is a red light. When fascism is here, anti-Semitism is here too. All the Jewish organizations of Ukraine, all the Jewish organizations, there are many, because there is still many Jews of Ukraine, in spite of the Nazi uh, collaborators of Ukraine during World War II, the Ukrainian Ustashis. There was a Ustashi sort of state in Ukraine. In spite of that, there is a lot of Jewish organization. All of them are on Maidan. All of them are in favor of this democratic riot upsurge, uprising. All of them are in favor of this unperfect democracy, but nevertheless democracy which is taking birth in Ukraine. So please think twice before and Google three times <laughs> before falling in the Putin speech. Go and check, I beg you. Thank you, we, hold, we have another question in the second row, Professor Milanovic. We have, we have some difficulty yeah. with the tech. We don't anymore. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm Professor Milardovic, I'm Professor of Political Science uh, from, the, from Zagreb. And uh, during my study for Political Science, I, I study uh, something about the new, new philosophers in, in the French. And uh, my question is, uh, what was happening, uh, happening, uh, happened with the uh, new philosophers uh, in the new time? Because uh, uh, your your uh, uh, official engagement uh, uh, during uh, 19 years uh, was according to Bosnia, uh, uh, and the, the second uh, eng engagement of uh, your friend uh, Alain Finkelkraut or or uh, Alain Finkelkraut was in Croatia, and the second uh, Henri Glixman was in the Chechenia. And what is your opinion and experience? Three different ways of uh, activity, former uh, French philosoph new philosophers. And the second question, uh, it was very interesting, uh, your critics uh, about the Putin. Uh, the Putin is from Russia. The, st uh, the Stalin was from Russia. The new philosophers, uh, critics, uh, was against uh, Stalinism. 
And uh, it is very interesting your observation about uh, a new enemy in, uh, in, the, in the Europe. The new enemy is uh, Putin. Uh, your critics in past time during your philosoph uh, philosoph your philosophy life uh, was a critic of uh, Stalinism. And uh, your critics, uh, new critics, uh, in the this time is critics of uh, uh, Putin, uh, uh, Russian first time, the Russian second time, same, uh, but, this, but but with a different uh, uh, time. And uh, from critic of uh, uh, Putin, tell me something about what you what you what you mean. Is there you know, the uh, the clash, not not civilization? The, the clash of uh, ideologies between a liberal de democracy, uh, Europe, uh, or Western civilization, Western culture, and the, and the new right in the in the Russia, with the, with the behind concept of the start to establish a Euro Euro Asian Union. And the, the third question, the end, the end of the questions. I, uh, you I, you know, I'm talking sorry. Some yeah. just, uh, sorry, you are sorry. monopolizing no, no, your no, no, time no, no, now. No, so no. Just please be short. 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 Something about the post democracy in the Europe, because you are uh, you are discussing something about uh, uh, democracy in in Europe. Uh, my question is according about something post democracy. Colin Crouch. Post democracy. Uh, what do you mean about post democracy? Or democratic? Defecta. Thank you for my attention or your attention. No, no. Thank you for your questions. Post democracy. I don't think I, 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 I pronounced these words. I don't believe in. Uh, I don't know what post democracy means. I believe in democracy, and I believe in the unfinishable work of democracy. I believe in the endless. Uh, work of democracy. I believe that the difference between democracy and its opposite is that, is that the opposite believes in the end, democracy has never end. This is the difference. Totalitarianism, all totalitarianism, the common point between all of them is that they do believe that there is a moment, there is a point when the good society is achieved, that the good state is shaped, that the good, the good community is formed. Democracy never believes that. Democracy believes that whatever the contract, whatever the majority, whatever the state, it has to be replayed next step and next stage. You know that, you're a professor of political philosophy. About Putinism, I do believe, yes, that there is a clash of civilization between the sort of ideas which Putin expresses and the ideas which are expressed by the Europe according to Edmund Husserl and others, not the West. The opposition is not Putin versus the West, because my belief is also, as it was the belief of Husserl, that European spirit has no border, and that European spirit, European wind, can blow everywhere. So it is not a geographical clash, but it is a clash, yes. Not as it was between Stalin and democracy, Putin is not Stalin. Putin has probably not the means to be Stalin. He is not strong enough, poor guy, to be Stalin. Maybe he would like. And probably he would like since he said, as you know, that the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century was the fall of the Soviet empire. So there is probably in Putin and in the oligarchs who are around him this dream of reviving Stalinism, but they can't. 
Nevertheless, I believe, yes, that it is a sort of clash. And that for the first time, as I, as I said before, there is, in Europe, there is emergency in accepting, in facing this idea that there is um, uh, an opposition. Now, what is Putinism? Putinism is the, you quoted, Eurasian ideology, which is the word which is proposed by your colleague, Timothy Snyder, especially in his great book, Terre de Sang, Earth of Blood, which is Russia. And there is two points to stress. Number one, Putin is not Russia. And about new philosophy, new philosophers, there is one for me, and I think for Henri Glucksmann, Finkelkraut is another story. There was one constant in our lives, which is opposition to Putin, to Brezhnev, to Stalinism, but love of the Russian people. I never mixed the Russian people with the governing power in Russia. And I believe that the pride of the Russian people the pride of the children of uh, Gogol, Dostoevsky, uh, Tolstoy, and others is not expressed by Putin, who was not expressed by Brezhnev, and was not expressed by um, Stalin. The other thing which I, I, I believe is that, of course, there is a peculiarity of each situation. So what is Putin? Putin is the son of three things. He is the son of the Afghan war. He comes from there. He was a KGB agent during the war in Afghanistan. He is the son of the Chechenia war, which was the worst nightmare in uh, modern times still since World War II. And he is the son of Chernobyl. Chernobyl, which is the situation of a country, big country, having no real control on its nuclear plants and representing for this reason a real danger. Putin is all that. KGB in Afghanistan, massacre and bloodbath in Chechnya, and the Chernobyl of yesterday and of tomorrow. The R Russian people know that, not all of them. Putin today is popular, as Marine Le Pen is popular in France, as uh, uh, Tujman was popular in uh, Croatia. But a lot of Russians know that, and they will prove knowing that, I, I think, quite soon. Um, thank you. Another question. Uh, Ms. Uh, yeah, back there. I'm Sasha, I'm a student in diplomacy and negotiation. Monsieur Lévy, je vais vous poser la question en français. Quels sont, d'après vous, les meilleurs moyens pour, justement, empêcher la Russie d'aller plus loin dans cette offensive en Ukraine, en tout cas Et euh, <coughs> ne pensez-vous pas que l'Ukraine est en train de vivre un, un scénario qui pourrait sembler similaire à celui qu'a vécu la Pologne ou bien encore la République tchèque euh, dans les années 40, puisqu'elle est sur le point d'être, en tout cas, dépecée On l'a vu par euh, ce qui s'est passé en Crimée. Je vous remercie. Now, if I just may ask you, would you be mindful enough to ask the question in English? Because we unfortunately haven't provided translation for everybody the, sitting the here. Question, the question is, what is the best way to prevent, <laughs> yeah, to prevent uh, Russia to fulfill its goals in Ukraine? And is not Ukraine going to know the same fate as Poland? in the darkest times? Uh, it's a difficult question, of course, and um, it's always difficult for Democrats to oppose someone who believes in strength and in force. Putin believes only in force. And this is the weakness of democracy, since always, that Democracy are never good in the game of force, except 
Churchill or De Gaulle. But the rule is not that they are not so good. Nevertheless, there are some ways to resist. First of all, to name the things. When the German Minister of Foreign Affairs say the sentence I quoted before, that we have to, to, to stop Putin before he becomes an adversary, ne laissons pas Putin devenir notre ennemi, this is a crime against spirit to say that. It means that we already agree about the absorption of Crimea, about the dismantling of um, East of Ukraine, about the cancellation of the election of the 25th of May, next 25, and so on. So number one, have the good words, have the good sentence. Albert Camus says, those who name badly the world commit the evil, commit the evil, commit bad deeds. I really believe that. I do believe also that we should be much more offensive in opposing the main argument of Putin, who is the argument of linguistic nationalism. The strength of Russia today is that they have created a sort of commonplace, a lieu commun, according to which a state has the, res the, the right and even the duty and the responsibility to help those who in other countries speak the same language. We have the duty to say that this way of reflecting under its apparent, apparent uh, evidence is the most dangerous one. If we follow this path that Russia is, um, has the right to protect all the Russian speaking citizens in other countries, then it will be the mess, the disorder and the war in all Europe, in Romania, in Hungary, in uh, Belgique, Belgium, and everywhere. It should be possible to say that. It should be possible to say, after very good political scientists, by the way, that the, the linguistic nationalism is a terrible illusion and a terrible uh, a bad dream which should be diluted. Number three, it is possible to it is possible that Putin is strong of our weakness. It is not excluded that the main strength of Putin is our weakness, as it was for Milosevic. I remember these three years of nightmare which Croatia knew and lived, and then Bosnia, and even more Bosnia, when Milosevic, in a total impunity, bombed your cities and the cities of Bosnia. What was the strength of Milosevic? It was not its army. Remember, in two days, Sarajevo was freed without any dead in the alliance. Within a few weeks, the, Bos the Croat Bosnian army pushed uh, the, the Serbs. And you could have reached Banja Luka if the authors of the Dray Dayton Agreement has, had um, authorized. So Milosevic, the strength of Milosevic was the weakness of Europe. And I think that it is the same for Putin. He is strong because we are weak. He is strong because we believe that he is strong. His strength is nourished by our belief in his strength because we are the victims of his propaganda. That's the source of his strength. Let's try to implement some real sanctions. Let's try, when the president of the Duma comes to Paris on the behalf of UNESCO and ag the agency of the United Nations to implement the law and to arrest him, let's try. We'll see. Maybe Putin will retreat. 
The only time when Russia put, did put hands off Ukraine was when the Polish, German, and French Minister of Foreign Affairs went in Kiev and dismissed Yanukovych. There was a, a demonstration of strength and there was a withdrawal, a with, withdrawal of uh, the gang around Putin. It is possible. We can be stronger and if we are stronger, he will be weaker. Just before we give uh, the microphone to Mr. Sever, just one short interception. Today, Mr. Putin has called for the Ukrainian Russians uh, not to go on with the referendum. It's today's news. How do you see that? As, as another manipulation or as a true gesture of trying to stabilize the country? We shall see. We shall see. He said two things. He, appeal, he called for these uh, Russian speakers to stop the referendum and so on under the condition that, that the Ukrainian uh, state stops his attempt to implement rule and law and the rule of law. The two were committed together. Uh, I think it is a tricky game if, uh, thanks, uh, thanks God it will never happen, but if a part of Croatia was occupied by uh, Serbian militias, uh, acted by outside, uh, armed by a foreign country, uh, if they created uh, some uh, uh, gangster, uh, gangsterish riots, the state of Zagreb would have the duty probably to implement the order. And I would be very surprised if um, the state would say, okay, we, we withdraw our policers, policemen, we withdraw our troops, uh, if uh, they stop asking a plebiscite uh, for independence and so on. I fear it is a trick. I feel he still playing games, but we'll see. Thank you. Mr. Sever. Kresi Mir Sever, Independent Trade Unions of Croatia. Let me go back from Russia to European Union in one question, please. Can you tell us how much money Europe pumped to save banks during crisis and at the same time how much money Europe pumped in measures against rising poverty in Europe during this crisis? Which kind of social sense face of Europe is that? Thank you. Uh, I have not the figures, so I cannot reply, but I see the, the sense of your question. You are probably right but you might be also wrong in a way. I think that if the financial system had failed, the social price would have been huge. Um, we all know, we all have the, the memory, indirect memory of the crisis of 1929, when there was a bankruptcy, a fall of all the financial system. The social price was high. So I suppose, without being an economist, I suppose that Europe has to walk on her two legs. The social program, the welfare states, which uh, should not be abandoned, and they are not, we have some unions and some uh, opinion, public opinion movement who, pre who would prevent that. But also, um, a Europe in which the bank system would explode would be a, a camp of ruins, a field of ruins. 
for all European peoples, probably not for bankers. They are already rich, and some of them have already the money outside their own country. But the, the people who are seeking for employment or who live from their work, these one would have been in a much worse distress should have the bank system failed. Now the next question is, did European Union save the bank system unconditionally? This is a good question. Or did the BCE, European uh, Common Bank, did it um, uh, link some rules to their plans of uh, sauvetage, of helping the banks? The reply is probably not enough, but the reply is yes. One cannot say that the, the helping of the banks was done un not unconditionally. And as I said before, if there is today some rules if there is today some warnings in the warn warning red lights in the big banks, if the bankocracy, bankocracy can, cannot act any longer as it did in the beginning of the golden years of the liberal era, it is thanks to the European power. The, the states, national states did not dare and they did not have the power by the way. No country, no European country has the power to domesticate its own financial power because the financial power is uh, without borders. But Europe together as a whole did have this power and they did it unperfectly again, but they tried and they did in, they did in part. Thank you. Now, my, my chair has warned me that our time is running out. Uh, but, however, I will allow just one final question, and then we will allow you to wrap things up. Thank you. Hello. Can I? Oh, sorry. So, obviously, we will have two questions, but I beg you, please be my short and precise. Yes, of course. My name is Zavarka Pšenica, and I'm a candidate for European Parliament, and uh, I am a member of the Croatian Labour Party. And uh, my question is very short. Here in Croatia, I would prefer to say, is yet a certain number of people who are eurosceptics. So if you will be now on my place now as a candidate, what, you will, what answer you will send to them? This is, um, and, and this so is a bit of a political propaganda, and we are no, in a, in no, a campaign. No, no, I, no. I, and so to what I'm sorry, you about know, error skepticism, because uh, many people here in Croatia don't believe truly that European Union can really help to this region. Show, show them, I, I, if I were at your so place, I would compare, I would take one example of another country in Europe, for example, France. It is a case I know best. France before the euro, the currency, and France after. France between the oil shock uh, 30 years ago and the implementation of euro. Eight devaluation of the franc, of the currency. Um, a huge inflation. The poor people impoverished every year more when the, when the prices grow 10, 12, 15% every year, as it was the case in France before a strong Europe. I remember that. I remember the 20 years before the Euro, the prices did raise, did go up 10, 12% every year. For the rich people, it was not a problem. For the poor, or for the middle class, it was a tragedy. Inflation plus the devaluation repeated was a nightmare for the people. Since the euro, there is still nightmare for the unemployed, for the uh, 
people, the have-nots, and there is a lot, but much less that in, than in these times. So if, if I were you, I would study one case, not mine, not the France, maybe look at uh, Italy or whichever, look at Greece. In Greece, uh, till two years ago, nearly nobody paid uh, taxes. There was a real uh, tax, uh, every, uh, tax flee, tax uh, escape. Uh, and especially the rich people. Implement, implementation of the European law means, in particular, obligation for the people, middle class, high class, to pay the tax. So I would take examples like this of brother states, brother peoples of Croatia, having passed through the two situations. I'm sure it is easy to show that even if the ideal, the ideal city is not of this world, is not in this world, the situation is better with Europe than without. I know we are, now we have to stop because I have to go to see the play of uh, in Zagreb, of a great, a great friend, but a great play director, theater director, who is Dino Mustafic. He's premiering his next play very close to here. I know that uh, it will take, a, it will last for many days and many weeks, and I encourage all of you to go to the play of Dino Mustafic, where I go just now. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies, but we are obviously short on time. Uh, thank you so much for your patience, for your time. Thank you for your time and uh, your inspiring answers. Uh, and, well, it's the 25th, right? Uh, get out and vote. Thank you. Reklama vam obično pokušava reći što trebate raditi. Ali ova reklama želi da vi kažete nama što trebamo raditi. Iskoristi svoju moć. Biraj tko odlučuje. Glasuj. 25. svibnja. Ovo je reklama. Europski izbori. 25. Reklama vam obično pokušava reći što trebate raditi.